Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vario, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Managing Agile, Transforming the Three Dysfunctions of Management by Diana Larson. about the things I'm talking about 
And, you know, when I'm thinking about 10 years ago and now, uh, being here in Salt Lake, where next year will be the Federal Alliance, the Federal Conference. If you haven't figured that out yet, talk to Phil. So, we're here to talk about managing Agile, the three dysfunctions of management. And, of course, I sort of stole the three dysfunctions thing from the five dysfunctions of a team deal. I mean, I figure if a team gets dysfunctions, management should have dysfunctions as well. Um, there must be some there somewhere. <laughs> uh, but I, don't, I do not intend this talk as um, an opportunity for bashing managers. Um, as, as you'll learn as we go through this, you know, I really do want to take a systemic view. And any of us that are working in a system have our behaviors influenced by the structure and construct of that system. And so it's just as true for managers as it is for team members. But I do see some recurring patterns, and I do see some patterns that really do cause some problems. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, I found this, this great uh, Peter Drucker quote. I think it's, he I wrote this maybe 15, 20 years ago, but I think it's still true. You know, we are in such a time of, uh, marketplace churn and organizational churn and um, information overload kind of churn and so on that that we really all have huge opportunities. I mean, these are these are the times that give rise to enormous opportunities to make things different, to make things better. It's much harder when everything's skating along in the status quo and everyone is comfortable to make any shifts. It's when things get in turmoil, when things are turned upside down, that we're able to make the kind of shifts that we need to make, to look at the assumptions that we've been working under, to rethink. And so that's what I'm hoping we can do as a result of this. Um, up until now, there has been a sort of an assumption about what it is that managers do in organizations. And it really is this list of things that I'm not going to read to you. You can read for yourself. But so there's a big body of work that that managers have been responsible for. Um, you know, managing the budget and directing the work and making sure that things are coordinated. As if people doing the work couldn't do some of those things for themselves. In some instances, that may be true. But there's been a, um, a belief that in, in certain kinds of systems, this may be the best way for management to get done. If you've been in a highly bureaucratic system, this might be the best way for managers to work. However, if you're in an agile environment, this is all up for grabs, right? Because it's not just the manager who will do these jobs. Which calls into question, you know, so what will managers do? So I'm going to try to answer that question as we go along as well. So um, there's no point in dwelling in the past and saying, you know, well, why, how did we get here? Why did we get, I mean, I'm the bigger fan of retrospectives there is, but um, at some point you just say, well, this is just the way things are. Uh, we're going to accept reality. We're going to move forward. And, um, you know, Jerry said, as, as Jerry often does, he said it, you know, as, as well as anybody can say it about that. So, let's talk about these dysfunctions. And I'm going to think of them as traps. You know, it's not that we're bad people or that we're, you know, came from dysfunctional families. I mean, you know, I don't know what your family is like. I'm not going to make that assumption. Um, but there are certain traps that the way we have constructed organizations, the way we put um, our org charts together, the way we have our reporting relationships, uh, the assumptions that we make, have created some traps that we could fall into that cause dysfunction to happen in the organization. And the first trap is magical thinking. I, I don't know about you, but I go, in a lot of the organizations that I go into, someone will tell me about a decision that's been made, and I'll say, oh, well, that's interesting. 
interesting. So how, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, we just think that's the way things should be. Well, we're confident we can make that happen. I actually had a manager once who set uh, a revenue target for the department that I was, I was working in uh, that seemed a little odd to me. And so I went to him and I said, Dan, how did you decide we were going to make half a million dollars this year? When in every past year we had made well under 300,000. He said, I just know we can do it. And besides, it's what my managers want to hear. <laughs> so thinking I was being helpful, I went back to my desk and I figured out how many people were in the department and what kinds of projects we were working on and how much revenue, average revenue, each of those projects would bring in and what, you know, so on and so forth. And there was one really big project that we had that was actually getting ready to go away. It was a government funded thing. It was, it was leaving. And so I didn't know what was going to replace that, but okay, I'll make the assumption there'll be another one of those that came on. And, and I got the numbers and I said, this just doesn't even add up. So I went back in and I said, Dan, I got these numbers. Here's, here's our track record and here's what I see happening out in the future. And, I don't see how this is going to get us to half a million dollars. And he said, oh, I've never worried about budgets. And I said, oh. And I was gone in about five months from that place. Um, I, it, it was too hard to work there. It was too difficult to work in a place where there, there was no justification for decisions that were being made. I couldn't understand what was going on. And that pattern, I have seen that pattern over and over again. Maybe some of you have noticed in your organizations times when, yes. Okay, so I am not alone. I'm not the only one who sees this. Um, there's a, a, a woman that, that I uh, sometimes follow. She does a thing called The Work. And she's a very pragmatic person. She really focuses on questions like, do you really know that to be true? What would happen if that was not true? Things like that. And this is one of her sayings. You can fight reality and you'll lose, but only 100% of the time. <laughs> right? And yet, in our organizations, we continue on making decisions based on wishful thinking. So I dug into this a little bit. And um, there's a, a, a really good book out right now called Hard facts, dangerous half truths, and something, total lies or something. I've, I've got the book in my bag. I'll show it to you later. Um, it's by uh, Jeffrey Pfeiffer and Bob Sutton. And their whole point is that there needs to be a shift to what they call evidence based management. Right? That that is one of the things that helps us move out of wishful thinking. And, and they came up with this list that too many management decisions are made based on what somebody hopes will happen or fears will happen, um, what other people are doing and having some success with, which is a lot of what I think we're seeing in Agile right now. We see someone else is having, seems to be having success with Agile, or we wrote an article, or we've heard a story about someone else having success with Agile. So we just apply some of that stuff. We start having meetings without really digging into why did that work for them? And what does that mean about whether or not that will work for us? And what would have to be the same or different for that to work for us? I love Jeff's talk this morning because it you know, really digs into that question. How do we know? How do we know that'll work for us? Um, in some instances, making business decisions based on what's happened in the past, even though we can clearly see the future is going to be different. And, you know, this idea of what we think should work. Well, they should understand what this requirement specification says, because I did my best at writing it clearly. So they should understand it. And the fact that they don't 
somehow doesn't, doesn't have as much credence as the fact that they should. So they have chapters on this in the book, and it's, and it's fascinating stuff, actually. So I think one of the ways that Agile, well done, thoughtfully applied, uh, constructed in context, uh, addresses this is that Agile, actually, if you're willing to look at it, supplies a lot of evidence. Right? We keep data. We have boards. Big physical boards that are right in the room, you can come look at them. You know, we probably have some kind of burn down charts or burn up charts. We probably have looked at our risks. We may have asked for our team to be chartered when we got started so that we can have a clear idea of what it is we're, we're all trying to accomplish here together, what outcome we're looking for. Right? And how that's going to satisfy any sort of business case for the organization. Agile provides a lot of evidence if someone is willing to look at it. It also highlights the things that are in the way. I mean, that's one of the, one of the issues, of course, um, sort of everything comes with its upside and downside, is that, you know, if there's something not working in your organization, if you're really doing the old college try at adopting Agile, all those things that don't work in your organization are going to show up pretty, pretty clearly. And you have to be willing to look at them. But then once you look at them, you can figure out what to do about them. Right? Until you look at them, you can't figure out what to do about them. Um, Agile, it, 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 one of our values kind of is transparency. You, know, you get to see what it is we're doing. Anytime, come on by. Come take a tour, Menlo Innovation says. We'll show you, right? right? We're just, we're just all hanging out in this big room together, you know, <laughs> everybody can see, right? So, um, and, and this idea of continuous improvement, that we're never really there yet, that we're always looking for ways to get better, whether we're doing that, you know, with a Kanban kind of way, or whether we're doing that iteratively and really focusing on continuous improvement actions coming out of retrospectives, it doesn't really matter the, the specific practice. The idea is that we really are devoted to making sure that things continuously improve, and in order to do that, we have to collect data. How, otherwise, how will we know if there's been any improvement? Um, and we, we, because of the cross-functional nature, because we want to collaborate, you know, there are more perspectives brought to bear. And any time we have more perspectives, we have a better idea of what it is we're working on. And, and of course, we have more perspectives, so we can look back we can see what can be learned, what wisdom can be gained, and we can make decisions based on what we've really learned as opposed to what we think should happen. So there's a lot in Agile to really help this, you know, get rid of that big pothole that could be magical thinking, wishful thinking. Uh, oh, here's the book. Evidence-based management skills. It's, uh, they have a lot in there about this particular issue, this, this wishful thinking, and, and really making sure that we're making our business decisions based on really good data. There's another uh, stream out there called disciplined optimism. So uh, sometimes when I say we have to make all our decisions based on data, so someone will say to me, yes, but isn't it the job of the manager to hold the vision and, you know, shouldn't I be telling people, you know, giving them aspirational goals and stretch this and that, so, and, you know, yeah, you should be holding the vision of kind of what the product needs to be or, or what outcome we need for our organization. Yes, hold that. But when we're planning this release, Stick to what we know, right? So maybe long term, yeah, vision. Short term, let's let's work for data. Okay, let's let's work for data. If uh, this discipline optimism is a uh, an interesting thing that I ran across that has to do with um, holding your aspiration, but not ignoring kind of 
unwelcome facts. <laughs> and so a lot of this has to do with managing the paradoxes that come up. And that, I think, is one of the jobs of management. Because there are a lot of paradoxes in the work that we do. Another way of, of working from data is to develop a, what I call a tracker's view. I have um, a number of friends and family members who do a lot of wilderness tracking. And one time I was asking them about that, and it turned out what they do when they go out in the woods sounds a lot like what I think works for managers to do. It's worked for me, anyway. And so in, uh, new ways of gathering evidence, new ways of gathering this data is, you know, look, look differently. Look at things differently. Take a new perspective. If you had your management hat on just for the day, say, well, if I were walking into this project and I were a chemist, how would I perceive this differently? If I walked into this project and I were building um, skyscrapers, how would I see this differently? And try that on. Try on those hats. Maybe try on some of the hats of the personas of people that you're trying to serve. But it helps you to think about things in ways you're not used to. Um, one of the things the trackers talk about is the dead zones. And the dead zones are places where we don't normally look. Or places where we just aren't aware. Like right now, right up here, this is a dead zone to me. I can't see my hand. I don't actually know what it's doing other than the sensation I have. Right? That's dead zone. For me to know what that is, I have to look up. Right? I have to look behind me. I have to look around. And all of us, every day in our daily lives, have dead zones. Places where we've just, we've gotten out of the habit of looking. And managers really can't afford that. So we need to help identify the dead zones and begin to look there as well. Um, Making sure that we're seeking information, seeking our data from lots of different sources and not always relying on the same channels. Learning to notice the things that we want to have happen. And make sure that we are recognizing that and interacting with that appropriately. Right? If we, if we want people to be pairing, that example. You know, let's make sure we notice when it works or create situations where it will naturally occur. And uh, this last one is one of my favorites. Uh, when you, when, the way the trackers describe it to me is that when you go out into the woods, right, imagine yourself sort of walking down a path into the woods. And you hear a bird call that can be way off in the forest. Right? You hear a bird call, that's your area of disturbance. <laughs> They're talking about you. It's not something else that's happening. They're talking about you. And so, so that means, you know, the height of bird, right? The observer is the observed, right? Every place we're walking is changed by the fact that we're there out to the limit of our area of disturbance. So we're not really seeing what would, what's real there, what would normally be happening, because this, this other thing is happening. So, so the idea is reduce your area of disturbance so that you can see what's real, and, all, and reduce your impact on the environment so that you can get real data out. Well, you know, expanding your own awareness, hopefully beyond that. So I think that's an interesting little bit. So the second track. The second track is the illusion of control. Um, it's interesting that wishful thinking, magical thinking, and the illusion of control are actually like documented psychological states. <laughs> you can find them on the web. And the illusion of control is this idea that if, if I hold on tight enough, you know, I can, I can make things happen the way I want them to happen. And it's kind of like, you know, gripping a handful of sand even tighter, right? You open it up and it's gone. So there is this 
this this idea that if we if we um, the, the real way to get control is not to micromanage the details, but to set the context and then watch what happens there and make adjustments as, as needed. So um, another one of those paradoxes: the more you exert control, the less you actually have. So I. Um, Again, in preparing for this in my, in my studies, I found this interesting, uh, Jules Polsky has done a whole blog post about the illusion of control. And he came up to these three draw, with these three broad drawbacks uh, to command and control ways of management. People don't like it. So you're not getting their best work. Because they're spending a certain amount of time griping about the fact that you're commanding and controlling them. And that is not a productive time. So people don't like it. Um, I, was, I, I love your management by walking around slide, right? <laughs> right? You can't sit with everybody all the time, so you end up hit and run management, right? Which is just disruptive. Which also is, you know, so you become the person who is reducing your productivity. And people who are closest to the work, and this comes up over and over again. Joel is the first one to say it. Deming has said it. A lot of other folks have said it. Uh, the person who's closest to the work is in the best position to really make decisions about the work. They know more than you could ever possibly know. So, so how does Agile help you avoid that trap? So Agile um, emphasizes craftsmanship and self-organizing teams. So it, it starts from a premise that we're coming to work, we want to do our best, our best work at work. Uh, if we're given the right setting to do that in, you're probably going to get more from us than you would in some other way. Um, again, promoting communication, promoting visibility, uh, promoting a good work environment ways of setting that context to get control, real control. Um, feedback and, and continuous learning also helps to, to give that, that sense of, if you, know, if, you, if, you, if you really want to know what we're doing, come on down to the demo. Watch our demo. Tell us what you think. That's how you steer. You don't steer by standing over our shoulder or disrupting our, our sprints. And, and the other thing is that Agile really does celebrate what's real, back to by Katie, uh, in, in the sense of we, we know and accept that there is uncertainty and unpredictability in the world. We know that's what life is. That's why we've got responding to change or we're following the plan in the manifesto. We take that as a given, and so we know how to work with it. We have a lot of techniques and practices and things that we have developed that help us work with like that. So, you know, you may not get the kind of holding tight control, but you have the kind of control that comes with letting go and paying attention. So one of the tools for that, um, I recently attended a, a workshop with David Snowden on the Kinefin framework. So beginning to think in terms of systems, because there is some, if you, if you can move up to the systems level, there are some predictable patterns that we can count on. And really thinking about what is the nature of the work that's going on where you work. You know, can we rely on best practices? Do we have really simple work where we can just see what's going on, categorize it, and then have the, the already programmed response? pull the best practice off the shelf because this is work we've been doing forever. It's always the same, you know, no matter how many times you lick and stamp envelopes. That process stays, you know, pretty much the same. And, you know, if you've got a big pile of envelopes to lick and stamp, um, one person could probably do the whole thing. It would just take a lot longer. So we might bring a group of people together to do that, but there's no real synergy there. It's still just licking and stamping known process and you know we may have figured out that it's better if we crease the thing before we start stuffing it and you know but we figured that out pretty quick 
So simple, simple work. Complicated work, and, you know, it's not quite so straightforward. There's a lot more moving parts, but things aren't always exactly the same. There's some diagnostic issues that have to happen here. Um, so we look at what happens, we have to do some analysis before we choose our response. But the thing is, it's well within our capability, right? It's stuff we know about. It's just lots of pieces of parts to put together and collect. So in that instance, we want to find, it may not be one best practice, but we, we're expert enough to know kind of what the range of good practices are and to choose the appropriate one that we think will best fit the situation. Do either of those sound like software development work? Not really. <laughs> so then we get to complex work, right? And this is where we really, things are changing all the time. There is that uncertainty, there is that unpredictability because new stuff comes on the scene and and sometimes as a result of what we have done, we get new stuff that impacts us. Which is, I think, why the, you know, many of the features that we write we need to throw away because we learn new things as we go along, right? New stuff emerges for us. And so here we have to figure that out. And um, then the connection framework, David says, what we do then is we probe. We poke it a little bit. Then we see what happens. Then we choose our response. So it emerges out of our experience, out of that experience of poking. So you can see what happens. If you try this, then what? Does that change things? Do things stay the same? And then finally, there is an area of um, chaotic work, which is, you know, there's a flood coming. <laughs> and we got to figure out how to deal with it. We haven't dealt with a flood before. Uh, so we may just have to take some action and see what happens. And then choose our next action based on what happened then. So then we've got, you know, really rapid emergence. And everything is new. Everything is new. But taking the time to think about what kind of work is in front of us. How much of it is simple? How much of it is complicated? How much is complex? It, are we in chaos? And what does that mean in terms of how we manage the work? Right? Really gives you more control than the holding on tight or the micromanaging. I read a, a recent study that said that um, over time, the one thing that has been the best predictor of organizational success Success in the marketplace, success as, as defined by the people who work there, of uh, many dimensions. Isn't, you know, isn't marketing or isn't innovation or isn't a lot of things that you might think it was. It's not about technology, it's not about having the latest technology. It's about having the strongest culture, which I thought was fascinating. And so instead of the illusion of control, Part of the, the way that managers can get real control and move out of that dysfunctional trap is to really help to create a vital generative culture wherever you are. You get more real control over what kind of culture you're in than in any other way. So we do that by focusing on value, flow, and people and make sure that we're keeping up this, this sense of continuous learning and continuous improvement. And of course, both of those are supported by all kinds of agile practices. So, another place managers should focus, this is according to Mary and Tom, managers should focus on enabling intelligent, self-organizing, mission-focused behavior at the lowest levels of the organization. That's about what kind of culture to be. Because our, our culture is the enabler. So, trap number three. <coughs> I'm going to make my 50 minute deadline. The 
fantasy of individual blade. Um, you know, I, I go into organizations and I find people spending a lot of energy on figuring out who's to blame for something that just happened rather than just fixing it. Right? Like it's more important that we can pin it on somebody than we actually can make progress and move forward. That to me is hugely dysfunctional. And, and I really want to move away from that. I think it's important that we move away from that. And one way of moving away from that is also thinking systemically. Um, the psychologists have a, a formula, B is a function of P in E. Behavior is a function of a person in an environment. Behavior is not just about the person. Behavior is about the person in the context, in the environment, responding to the stimulus that is there. So, it follows that performance, which is one kind of behavior, productivity, which is one kind of behavior, is a function of the person and the environment. So it's not, sim it's not so simple as just blaming someone for something that happens. We can't fall into that trap because that ignores the whole piece of it that has to do with the environment. Um, here's one of my favorite Debbie quotes, along with one of my favorite pictures. The performance of anyone is governed largely by the system. And the system is the responsibility of anyone. So I don't 
So job management, instead of knowing who to blame, really is about focusing on the work environment and the value producing system. They work, you work at that level. More interesting, really, than dogging people around, micromanaging other people's work. There's a huge challenge here. Focusing systemically. And um, Gloria Elia has um, said a couple of books out. She is a, a, something called the Human Systems Dynamics Institute. She really studies human systems and how those work. And she's given us a, a tool called the CBE model where we can look at um, what's going on in our organization in three, in three ways. One is what containers are there, right? Container is anything that has a boundary. Anything that's a bounded content right, is a container. So a team is a container. A multi-team project could be a container. We can have we can have multiple belongings. We can be in many containers at once as individuals. But it's useful to know what containers there are. And what are what Alien calls the differences that make a difference? between the containers. How are they different? Why, 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 is, why is that remarkable? Why should we notice that? Again, gathering data. Right? And then what exchanges happen between the, the containers? Where is information passing? What kind of other handoffs are going? Where are there transactions? So there are some tools out there for managers to use to begin thinking at that systemic level. So for me, the real, the real issue here around these three traps, these three dysfunctions, magical thinking, the illusion of control, and the fantasy of individual blame, is shifting our focus to what is emerging and how do we create the most resilient and sustainable organizations? How do we create a context within which people can express their resilience and can notice what's emerging in them and outside of them? So, in conclusion, I invite you Think about what one thing will you take away from these ideas? Where are you falling into a trap? Where are you able to spring a trap for someone else by introducing a practice or an idea from Agile that might help them? What thing, one thing might you do differently? Think of it to yourself. Write it in your journal. Send yourself a tweet about it. <laughs> and speaking of tweets, if you want to get in touch with me, there are a number of ways to do so. <laughs> and they're all up there. And, and I really do enjoy talking with people about what's going on in your organization, you know, how your team's doing, how's that work for you, what experiments have you tried? What worked? Why do you think it worked? What didn't work? What did you try after that? So please, feel free to get in touch with me. And I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Do we have questions? Okay. <laughs> Identify? Okay. Two. Three. Four.
we're going to get the slides up somewhere, wherever so, all the slides are. Is there a recording as well? Yes. I think so. I didn't actually check that all out. The green shirts will know. Check with the green shirt. Well, I'm going to be here all the rest of today and all day tomorrow, so if you have feedback on this talk, I would love to hear it. Um, also, just as another um, invitation, sometime this evening, somewhere, that hasn't quite been figured out yet, we're going to try, because of my interest in pitching this learning, we're going to try out a new learning system called Where Are Your Keys? Some of you may have heard of it. There are a few people in the room who have played this game with me. Um, and with other folks, and it's just a fun game to play that really helps us understand a lot about learning. So find us, and we'll be playing. So thank you.